Hello and welcome to another exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine at recoverytodaymagazine.com where first and foremost we're a magazine of hope. Whether you're considering addiction recovery for yourself or a loved one or you're actively in recovery a short while or many years, you'll find information on all topics related to addiction, codependency, recovery, and living a happy, successful, sober life at Recovery Today. My name is Sherry Gaba. I'm the editor of Recovery Today, and I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing another great guest today. Ruby is a British writer, author, and thought leader currently located in Brooklyn, New York, formerly feature editor on the UK Sunday Time Style Supplement. She is the founder of Now Age Lifestyle Platform, The Numinous, and co-founder of Sober Curious. The event series, Club Soda in New York City, her two books, Material Girl, Mystical World, The Now Age Guide to a High Vibe Life, and Sober Curious, The Blissful Sleep, Laser Focus, Limitless Presence, and Deep Connection Awaiting Us All on the Other Side of Alcohol, are both published by Harper Collins. In June, which I suppose happened already, she um, published the Numinous Astro Deck, an astrology learning tool and oracle deck. Ruby is the host of the popular podcast, The Now Age and Sober Curious. Welcome, Ruby. Hi, Sherry. Thank you for having me. That's such a long bio. I feel like, wow, I did so many things. <laughs> well, you have done a lot of things. And yeah. you're worthy of having it all read out loud. And um, I didn't say your last name, so please tell everybody your last name. It's Ruby Warrington. Warrington, okay. Yeah. We'll go, well, at the end of the interview, we'll see how people can find your books and find you, and uh, we'll go through all of that. So, you know, I've heard this word, sober curious, uh, kind of thrown around a lot. I see it a lot. I see gray area mm. drinking, uh, mm. low bottom drinking. So tell me about sober curious. What is that? So sober curious was a, a term that I began using a few years ago, probably about three or four years ago, to describe my own evolving relationship with alcohol. Um, I had been a kind of heavy social drinker, but I never saw myself as an alcoholic. Um, and over the course of many years of just kind of questioning my drinking, all of my behaviors around drinking, all of my attachments to it, all the expectations in my community and, and sort of friendship group around drinking, all of the questions, um, I came to this place where, well, Perhaps I'm sober curious. I did go to a couple of recovery meetings, like 12 step meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, what I found there was not a reflection of my story. I went with a very open mind and a very open heart. Um, I have many friends who are in recovery who are working the 12 steps and had seen that help them so much, but it didn't feel like it spoke to me and my situation. Um, and so I, I continued with this questioning, bringing this questioning mind, like I said, to everything, every interaction with alcohol. And that is what I term being sober curious, literally getting curious and questioning and almost bringing a beginner's mind yes. to every interaction with alcohol. Yes. So does that mean that you believe in abstinence for yourself or for others? Or is it, does, is it sort of a personal journey? Everybody can be curious in their own way and how they want to manage alcohol? I believe in everybody getting so confident about trusting their own experience and trusting themselves that they're always able to make the right decision for themselves, for them. And for many people, when it comes to alcohol, due to the nature of the beast, it being one of the five most addictive substances on the planet that is also very readily available to us and marketed at us very heavily. I think that for anybody who's questioning their, their drinking and who wants to change their relationship to alcohol, abstinence is, yeah, it's a great way to go. And I highly recommend it. And I choose it for myself by and large. So I am pro abstinence. Absolutely. My questioning are at the end of kind of eight years now, I've got to a point where I really have to see no use for alcohol whatsoever in my life. Um, I no longer crave or desire alcohol. Thank you. Um, and I also, you know, I also recognize that the level to which I was dependent or addicted to alcohol, and I do acknowledge that I was addicted on some level, um, was very different from somebody who may be relying on a 12 step program to get them through a date, like daily cravings for alcohol. Well, I, I love this word curious. And I love the fact that you bring up beginner's mind. You know, people don't mm -hmm. know what that is. It's sort of having like a sort of a baby 
curiosity really. Yeah. The infant has a curiosity of all the wonder around. And what I would, you know, tell clients, I'm a therapist, is that mm -hmm. uh, be conscious of it. Like when you drink, you know, kind of just sit there for a minute and be aware, like, you know, what's going on? Well, what is the goal here? Why am I picking up this drink? So it sort of helps people kind of start where they are because mm -hmm. you're right, going to a 12 step meeting, um, although it's an amazing program, it, it's changed lives immensely. Um, it's not always for, it just doesn't always speak to everyone and especially mm -hmm. the younger generation. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, I wonder sometimes, cause there are so many paths towards recovery. We have so many individuals out there kind of speaking recovery in different languages. Do you think it waters down the original intent of the founders of the 12 step? Um, I don't know. I think the intent is the same. If the intent is for people to be free of their addiction to alcohol and to live, as you described in the beginning of your introduction about your organization, to enable people to feel empowered in that, then I think the message is actually being compounded and actually carried out to a wider audience um, through these many different avenues and voices. I hope that anyway, you know, what do you, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, I ha it's kind of a slippery slope. I was married to an alcoholic and he was what, what I would call a really bad alcoholic. I mean, mm. he could not drink. And I don't know if, if dabbling a different past would have worked for him. I'm not really sure. Maybe it would have. I think the, you know, so far the only thing that's ever worked for him is the 12 steps. And, mm. um, but that's, you know, that's his story. And I really respect what you're saying that everybody has a different story and a different experience. And, um, you know, there've been times in my life where I probably was drinking too much. I even went to an AA meeting. It didn't resonate for me because I couldn't relate to all of the it was either you were, or you weren't. I mean, there wasn't this, this like this gray area place mm -hmm. where you know, mm -hmm. just kind of abusing it for a minute because someone mm -hmm. was or you've had a breakup, but it doesn't mean that you're an alcoholic. So I, I say bring it all out, you know, and that I think bring it up, bring it all, you know. And I also always say you shared that you tried, you know, you went to an A. I think that one of the best things about the program is that it's free and it's so accessible. You can find it anywhere in the world, you know. For, and you can attend for free. You have absolutely nothing to lose by checking it out. And if it resonates with you, then fantastic. Exactly. Go for it. No, I'm, I'm, and if not, then thankfully now there are more. It's, it's becoming, I think, the, I think what I see as the most positive thing about this kind of sober curious or these different conversations is that it's hopefully destigmatizing the subject of addiction. And it is enabling people the free... The, the, the choice, I suppose, to even begin to question it and to question it openly and to not feel like it has to be something, if they are maybe more dependent on alcohol than feels healthy, if that's ever, could ever be healthy to be dependent on alcohol, but if they're struggling in any way to feel less shame about opening up about that or seeking help. I heard a, a statistic, which I'm sure you're aware of, but um, that only one in 10 people who perceive alcohol to be a problem for them will ever seek help. Yeah. And I was wondering about that before we got on the call. Is that because there is so much shame or is it because it only gets like that bad? Like, yeah, I think it's because for, for one in 10 people, you know? Well, I think in cult certain circles, and I was going to get into some of that, it's like so normalized and glamorized. Mm. So like, people don't even realize that they have a problem. Mm. Um, but if you look at this, the scientific evidence, you know, any more than five ounces for a woman once, a, you know, a couple times a week or is, is probably more than you should be drinking. I don't know if that means you're an alcoholic, but I don't think people realize, you know, like they're, they're, they have a problem. I think that's, I think that when, as we know, it's the only quote disease that says, you know, I don't have a problem because if I admit I have a problem, then I have to give it up. So I think it's a yeah. double edged sword. Um, it is. But I like I the idea of an opening, you know, like with your work and other people's work in, in the community, I think it just gives an opening for-, for Exactly. Like you said, it meets people where they are so that they can jump in. And that beginner's mind is really about like, imagine if alcohol, if you'd never had any interaction and you knew nothing about alcohol, you had none of the messaging, none of the cultural conditioning, and it presented itself in your life today. How would you approach that substance? Well, with extreme caution, <laughs> ultimately, because I mean, it tastes like poison. It has an immediate intoxicating effect. It has horrible side effects physically. So yeah, we would treat it with extreme caution, but because of the cultural conditioning, we, we don't, we don't question it. Exactly. Well, that's, that's what I was going to ask you. You know, why do you think we glamorize alcohol in the media? I mean, you know, the, the kind of slightly more cynical 
answer is that it's a multi-billion dollar industry that makes a lot of people a lot of money <laughs> um get people hooked and you've got them for life as customers um and you know i would spend a lot more in a bar if i was drinking than if i was on soda water so there's a whole industry that relies on us remaining addicted to alcohol um so i think that's part of it and i think the other part of it is that we're um we've got a cultural fear around confronting our more difficult emotions you know and we have this kind of this this idea that the bravado in the face of discomfort or pain or fear is is preferable to showing any vulnerability and so drink your way through it oh you know life's terrible have a wine keep calm carry on like all of that stuff it just kind of compounds this idea of like if i'm having a difficult time um i'll be respected more or i will be um accepted more if i just kind of like medicate my medicate my way through it you know and certainly the older generation i think we're getting we're becoming more self aware <clears throat> i was thinking about my mother who is i would say she's an alcoholic um mm -hmm. when you know we'll talk about my dad who passed away and she'll be like i don't want to talk about that that's too painful why would you bring that up i'd rather just not talk about it you know give me my yeah. drink yeah uh, i think that it's all you know i think it's getting better i think people that you know becoming much more you know they're they're having a more examined life Hopefully. definitely definitely and just there's less stigma around talking about our mental health and emotional well-being you know i think we've almost sadly reached a breaking point with that you know there's a great documentary that i'd highly recommend to anybody interested in this subject matter called um one nation under stress it just came out on HBO and it's with Sanjay, oh. Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Oh, yes, yes. And yeah. it's fantastic. He just looks at the, the compounded impact of stress, that catch-all term for all of those negative emotions we don't want to feel, whether it's pain, fear, anxiety, grief, loss. The compounded impact is huge rates in, in you know, spikes in suicide rates, huge spikes in opioid addiction, and it's just, you can see it playing out, you know? And so I think we have reached a crisis point in terms of mental health. And it's actually people have, have nowhere else to go but to begin talking about it, which is yeah. necessary. Yeah. <laughs> certain areas, like I live in Los Angeles, very stressful. I live in the mm. outskirts, so it's not as, there isn't as much traffic. But when I go into the city, oh my God, it's like, and, and I still feel it here. And, you know, I had a client come in yesterday and he moved to Arizona and He's like, I just can't believe the difference. I can't believe how much nicer people are, I mean, how much more relaxed people are. You know, I just kind of, it kind of gave me some, some thought like, wow, yeah. you know, it really is true. Where we live is, is, is an yeah. issue and how it's the stress. Yeah. You know, I have a lot of 20 something clients that come in and they're like, well, everybody drinks in college and it wouldn't be fun if I didn't drink. So what would you say to that 20 something? Oh, my dream is to do a sort of a speaker series or an event series that and make it a college tour and go around to speak to people with, to bring this sober curious approach to people at that age when for many of us, it's when we have the quote unquote freedom to kind of like dive into drinking culture. Um, and it is just so, so prevalent in terms of whether you're cool, whether you're popular, whether you're a fun person or whether you're a dorky person, you know? And it's so, there's such a, a huge, an immense need to fit in at that stage of life. And so alcohol is there to kind of rub off the edges of that discomfort and any feelings of inadequacy you might have. And so I would love to, to speak to people at that age and just remind them that actually what's really powerful is being completely comfortable being you. What's really powerful is a really strong, solid no based on what you actually want and what you actually desire for your life. What's really powerful is being able to show up every day like with full energy and full creative force to kind of make something amazing with your life and in the world, you know, and just, we we're going to go on a tour together because let's do it. <laughs> well, we, you know, and it's funny, I have an agent right now. We're talking about me going out and talking, not about specifically this, but my whole thing is the codependency and the love addiction. Because mm. what you just said, it was so fascinating. You go with the ability to say no. And I mean, it's no in many areas of, yes. of, a, of a young person's life. It's no to promiscuity. It's yeah. because when you drink, then you're going to probably, be more prone to promiscuity and you're not going to feel good about. So I believe, in my opinion, it all goes together, really. It absolutely does. There's a whole chapter on sober, curious sex, love and relationships. And there's a section on that where I talk about consent. And I hadn't, you know, a, a little known, a little discussed fact is that alcohol is the number one date rape drug. 
89% yeah. of people who are victims of sexual assault have been incapacitated with alcohol. And we're telling, pe we're telling people to watch what gets put in your drink, something like you put in your drink. The drink itself is what could well get you in that, that, that situation. So it's a really important message, yeah. It's, I'm really passionate about this. Um, mm -hmm. it, happened, it happened to me when I was 29 and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, it was hor horrifying. And it, yeah. it was, as I was, well, I mean, there's no excuse for that, what that person did, but the idea that I was, you know, inebriated did not help the situation. Yeah. And uh, then the, that traumatic event, when compounded, when internalized, when shame calcifies around that is what can actually then lead to more ingrained addiction, addictive tendencies as we find, seek any way we can to avoid addressing or feeling that pain. So it has, it snowballs, doesn't it? Yeah. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to address these issues before mm -hmm. they take on a life of their own. Mm -hmm. You know, the other, the other issue around the communities that I'm thinking of are like mommy communities. You know, I have mm -hmm. a young daughter, a um, young woman, she's a mommy and she was putting my granddaughter in a, um, preschool and they had like this mommy introduction thing at like 11 in the morning they're serving alcohol and I'm oh, like wow what's up with that and I've had clients who have gotten DUIs same thing they go out with the mommies and it's all about the alcohol and, th and we're not talking about always at night we're talking about like mm. after, you know maybe in England it's afternoon tea or it's lunch or it's um you know, let's go paint and drink you know everything is yeah it's as, as soon as the kids get out of school they meet at the yeah meet at the school gates and then it's like off to the park and have some wine while you know while they're playing on the swings or whatever yeah. So how do we change that culture? I mean, how do we how do we shift that? more support for working mums? Like that would be one way. More time, more affordable childcare, so that people can actually get help and they're not overwhelmed by the stress and the pressure of raising children. And so the only the most readily and available and quick fix for the stress that they're under is a glass of wine. I think that would be one way, you know? Yeah. I think it's so prevalent. Well, is there anything you'd like to add to this interview? Is there anything else you'd like to say, um, maybe to that, even to that parent who has a child that's struggling with addiction? Well, I think that, um, well, even for parents with younger children, I think, and this is not to sound judgmental at all, but just to be really aware of the, the way that your drinking is imprinting in your child's mind in terms of the beginning of that conditioning we have around alcohol. Mm -hmm. I led a retreat at the Kripalu Yoga Center, a, a Sober Curious retreat in February. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. I have another one coming up actually in February 2020. Mm -hmm. um, but we did, um, on the last day, we had, a, we had 30 people from all different walks of life. Um, and on the last day, we had a sharing circle, not dissimilar to the kinds of story circles they have in 12-step meetings. But um, it was a, a, amazing to me. I would say 70% or more of people who were examining their drinking acknowledged that the, the way their parents drank and the way that alcohol was presented to them as children was absolutely instrumental into the way that in the way that they had gone on to drink and so I just think you know really consider the the wider impact of your drinking habits on your kids right it normalized it for them it and completely it does yeah genetic predisposition and, and then of course we can talk about Gabar Mate I'm sure you know who he is he talks a lot about yeah. trauma and mm. uh, which can affect all addictions you know he, mm -hmm. he, was addicted to, he was addicted to CDs you know or something like mm. that mm child of the Holocaust and uh, mm. really early, early trauma. So there's just all of these variables um, to look at, but I love, you know, I love where you're, where you're, where you're starting at, you know, you're starting at where people are starting at. And I'm sure that you brought in a lot of people to that retreat that are like, again, not sure, kind of questioning mm -hmm. it. And um, I wonder if you have any stats on how many people sort of decided to stay sober or you know. following the retreat. I'm not sure. And like I said, it was a really wide range from somebody who'd been in AA for 10 years and who just wanted some different perspectives and tools yeah. to somebody who'd never voiced out loud that she, her drinking was problematic to her, you know, a woman in her fifties. So it was just a really wide ranging um, to, to a, you know, a younger sort of 20 something woman who was having a hard time dating and didn't know how to how to how not drink right. in, in dating situations. So it was really fantastic, and everyone everyone um, found something of use and had some kind of an insight. I think the big the common factor that helped everyone was really 
I had different exercises that help people really uncover the like deep seated why, like why am I drinking the way I am? Mm-hmm. And once you can begin, and you know, as a therapist, you know the importance of this, obviously. It's like once you can begin to understand the reason why, you only then really can you begin to unravel the behavior and actually think about what you might need to put in place to change the behavior. You can't just quit drinking and, and, and not replace it with something else. And that's not to say you need to literally like replace beer with alcohol free beer, but like replace it with something on the inside, replace the beliefs or the need for alcohol with some kind of a, you know, another way to soothe yourself, another way to comfort yourself, another way to help yourself feel safe. I've been telling a lot of clients to buy the weighted blankets. Oh yeah. I've been hearing about those. Because, you know, it's really about like, again, I, I try to, like you try to start where people are and it's like, kind of just sit with yourself for a minute. You know, what does mm-hmm. it feel like just to be uncomfortable for a minute and watch it pass and perhaps, you know, use a therapy a pillow on your heart for a minute. You know, I, mm-hmm. I think like food, you know, when I don't, when I eat and then I stop, I'm not hungry anymore. But if I just keep doing this, I'll just yeah. keep eating. Right. So yeah. it's, it's exactly idea. Um, it's slowing it down. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to ask, what is club soda? Oh, so club soda, it was, this is kind of where um, the Sober Curious journey went from inside my head to out in the world. It was um, early 2016. I started an event series where I would have a different theme for every event and I'd bring together a panel of different speakers. We'd have meditation, guided group meditations and various different sort of exercises all around the different things that come up with drinking. So we had one, for example, called Sex, Lies and Alcohol, which was exactly that thing. And it was just really giving people the opportunity to examine like, whoa, I have all these beliefs about alcohol as it pertains to my romantic life. And yet when I step outside of it and examine them, so many of them are false or unfounded or even dangerous. Yeah. Um, so it's this, the soda stands for sober or debating abstinence. And so it was all about this idea of like, this is a space for any, for anybody at any level, anywhere on the sort of spectrum of addiction, mm-hmm. um, to come to have a non-judgmental, non-stigmatized conversation about what's actually happening here. <laughs> nice. Nice. Are you yeah. still doing those events? Well, I haven't done one since September last year, actually. It's been an extremely busy year with promo for the book um, and various other projects. My co-founder, a, a meditation coach named Viet Simkin, she had a baby and also had a book out. So we're sort of waiting to, to catch our breath and we'll hopefully be bringing it back, if not later this year, then January 2020. Fantastic. I love what you're doing. It's great. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're, you're quite an influencer in this um in this, you know, pop, this culture, this, this mm. culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would you um, like to end with the interview and how can people find you and where can they get your book and all that good stuff? I think one of the, one of, I, I'd like to end with one of my favorite sort of discoveries, I suppose. Um, and it may be a reminder or an affirmation for people who've discovered this already. And it may be something intriguing for people who are curious Mm -hmm. but one of something I talk about in my book is something I call the confidence paradox and for me it's about how for myself and as with for so many people I used alcohol primarily to feel more confident in social situations a big one that began in my teens and it continued when I entered the workforce in my 20s and it just kind of escalated from there um and I was so petrified that without alcohol I would be so shy and timid and would never know what to say and would lose that sort of like wouldn't be able to dance you know like let loose on a dance floor because I would feel too inhibited and shy Mm -hmm. but what I've discovered is that without alcohol I'm so much more confident and it's kind of like once I realized that because I had been teaching my brain from the age of 14 that I needed alcohol to feel confident, I'd never really had a chance to kind of discover how confident I naturally am when I'm fully present with myself, when I'm fully like okay with all of my feelings, when I'm fully okay with that ability to say no to what's not working for me. And so I'm just, I've just been continually amazed by how much more confident I feel now that I don't drink when I thought it would be the other way around. Well, it's changing the belief. It's changing the idea that, oh, I can't, I can't, you know, socialize without alcohol. It's just yeah. the way you see the world. And 
you're right. I mean, people have, a lot of people start when they're 14, 15, and then they cover it up and they don't even realize they actually, there really is a person underneath there. That's exactly. really, exactly. A really confident person with really strong opinions and a really strong no when no is necessary. And like, you know, so much capability. And so, yeah, for anyone who's nervous about how not drinking might strip them of their confidence, I would just, um, yeah, like to leave them with that. <laughs> That's fantastic. And where can people find you and your book? Um, well, my personal website is rubywarrington.com and I have a podcast myself, the Sober Curious podcast, which is, there's a link on my website and it's also on iTunes. Um, and I have my personal Instagram as well is at Ruby Warrington. So that's, those are some great places to start to kind of get news of all the events I'm hosting, where I'm speaking, things like that. So, yeah. And the book is on Amazon? The book is on Amazon. It's also on Audible for people who like audiobooks. Um, I read the audiobook myself, which I was really pleased to do. Nice. So it's also on Audible and it's also available as an ebook. Nice. Well, thank you, Ruby. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. And I love what you're doing. And, you know, you just, you just provide such a great opening for this conversation. Thank you again for having me. And thanks for yeah, reaching out. It's lovely to meet you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for another amazing interview at Recovery Today magazine.